We were going to look today in Joshua chapter 24. It's a familiar passage, I hope, um, but I don't think we're going to look at the familiar part of it so much. It's kind of like if you tell somebody you're going to preach on uh, on uh, David and Goliath, and they think, "Oh, I can tune out. I can skip this one because I've already heard that story. I know, I know how it goes, the plot, and then all of that." And of course, that's an error, obviously, because the Lord uses the Scripture to speak to us at different times in our lives and brings different things out of it that we need at the moment. You know, it's it's a living word. It's not just uh, words on a page uh, that have been uh, that have been handed down for many generations. Uh, but in this case, in Joshua chapter twenty-four. Uh, it is a verse that has a section in it that is well known, and we're not going to skip that. But I think more we're going to focus on part of it that doesn't get as much airtime, if we can put it that way. Uh, it's not really focused upon. Uh, so in any case, if you understand the book of Joshua, you recognize what's happened. God has kept his promises to Israel. He has freed them from a, a multi-century slavery in Egypt. He has brought them through the desert. That was a 40-year process. Uh, at least that's what Israel turned it into uh, by their disobedience and by their lack of faith. Uh, God was ready to bring them into the land much earlier than that, but they weren't ready to follow him. And so consequently, uh, they uh, they lost their lives in the desert over a process of about 40 years until finally their kids came back to the, back, to the very same place that they had been. Now, this is not, and again, this is not our, our primary focus today, but just recognize that in those two generations, where would their kids have been if the parents had done what they were supposed to do? Uh, you know, it wasn't just the parents that spent those almost 40 years wandering in the wilderness. Their kids spent that time as well, uh, or they were born in the wilderness, and that's where their life began at. If the parents had stepped across and followed God into the promised land and actually uh, 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 con con uh, what overcome it, possessed it, then, of course, their kids' lives would have been much different than they ended up being. So uh, that's uh, here last week was Father's Day, and that's not what we're going on. But the point of the matter is our decisions matter. They don't just matter for us, and they don't just matter for now. They matter in ways that we have no way of judging ourselves, right? Uh, because uh, it's that old butterfly effect. A uh, butterfly in Japan flaps its wings, and there's a hurricane ends up being in Hawaii or something like that. You know, the idea that one decision leads to another and, and, and everybody is making decisions, going in different directions. God's weaving the whole thing together. Nothing catches him by surprise. Nothing, uh, nothing sneaks up from behind on him. Uh, but in any case, we have decisions to make. You know, this year particularly is an election year. And you may think that your vote matters. You may think that your vote doesn't matter. You may think that the outcome is already predetermined by this group, that group, or somebody else. I don't know. Uh, but in any case, our decisions do matter because God keeps record of our decisions, because our decisions always have consequences. Now, that's not supposed to be a scary statement. It's not a threat, right? Uh, the fact of the matter is, if you go here, then you can't go there at the same time. You know, if you have this for breakfast, then you can't have that for breakfast. You can't. Uh, our decisions have consequences, both small and large. And the point we're getting at here, really, is that our decisions have an effect much greater than we, than we may recognize. And so in, in the book of Joshua, the, 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 the children, the descendants of the, uh, of the original generation that was redeemed from Egypt, they crossed the desert. They have arrived at the same spot their parents were at. This time they're ready to follow the Lord. Their faith has been strengthened and they're ready to lead the wilderness. They enter the land uh, and uh, they are successful. God gives them victory after victory. Uh, and they end up controlling the land of Canaan, that eternal possession, uh, inheritance that God had promised 400 years plus earlier uh, to give to Abraham and Abraham's descendants. And so as you reach Joshua chapter 24, Joshua is nearing the end of his life. And as is appropriate, as he e nears the end of his life, he has some things that he wants to emphasize and some points that he wants to make. He wants to encourage those who are going to outlive him uh, to run the race that's set before them. Uh, properly, uh, to have the right goals, uh, to, uh, to, to, to go at it, to possess what still needed to be possessed, to have and enjoy all that God had wanted them to have and enjoy. You know, that's what the Bible tells us. The Bible says that, the, that, that, that God, uh, he's made all things for our enjoyment. You know, and the problem gets in when we try to take something that isn't ripe. You know, you may, I don't know what your favorite fruit is, but if you take it when it's not ripe, it's probably not your favorite anymore, right? It's not ready 
if you can wait until it's ready, until it's peak, until it's fresh, then you find out that it's juicy, it's sweet, it's whatever it is that, that it's supposed to be. You know what? You can do that with all kinds of things. Uh, things that aren't ready just aren't ready. And things that are that are half baked or 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 you know sloppily done, they don't generate the kind of, of of happiness and satisfaction that we're seeking after. We rob ourselves when we take things too early. Uh, we rob ourselves when we don't do things in the right order. Uh, and you can obviously list a whole bunch of very serious life choices and life responsibilities that that can all be traced back to this one thing of being impatient. I want this. Other people have it. It looks like fun. God says, don't. I'm going to take it anyway because it looks like fun. And we find out it's not it's not what it looks like because we're not ready for it. So in any case, you have here decisions. And that's what you come to in Joshua chapter 24. God or uh, Joshua uh, in verse number one, he gathers them together uh, and he reminds them uh, of what God has done for them. And as a result, he as he as he wraps that up, he's reminding them of that. Uh, verse 10, God says he's delivered Israel uh, out of the hands of those who would uh, try to trip them up, those who would bring them into temptation. Verse number 11, they crossed Jordan. And of course, there were warriors waiting for them. There were strong cities and fortresses uh, that Israel could not overcome on their own. But that wasn't a problem because there isn't anything that God can't overcome. And so God gave them victory. And there's a list of the different peoples that inhabited the land of Canaan that God had, had put into Israel's hand. Verse number 12, God continues speaking about that. Uh, and the, the last phrase of that verse, verse 12, is that God gave them uh, power over the two kings of the Amorites, but not with thy sword, nor with thy bow. All right, it wasn't your doing. It wasn't your strategy. It wasn't your material. It wasn't your planning. From start to finish, this is God who has done this. Uh, and this is something we need to not lose sight of. Right? The Bible tells us that the arm of flesh, uh, cursed is he who trusts in the arm of flesh. But we understand that doesn't work, beginning with salvation. Nobody can save themselves. Right? Uh, but beyond that, the whole Christian life, and, and, and we've heard abundant teaching about uh, how the Christian life can only be lived properly when we're not depending on our flesh, not gritting our teeth, not bearing down and trying to force fruit out, uh, uh, but instead that we're allowing the Holy Spirit to do that stuff through us, right? We're Our job is just not to get in the way uh, in, in that case. Don't mess it up. God's got it under control. Don't mess it up. So when he says stop, you stop. When he says go, you go. Uh, and 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 that's it. That's, that's what we're supposed to be doing. So that's verse number 12. Uh, God gave him victory, but it didn't come through anything that could be measured uh, you know, by, by a pole company or something like that. It was a spiritual thing. It was based upon their, their following the Lord. Okay, so consequently, verse 13, God says, I have given you a land for which ye did not labor. That sounds pretty good, right? Uh, I mean, we understand cause and effect. If I work, then I should receive a paycheck and I should, you know, get benefit from that. But God says, you know, I gave you this land and you didn't labor for it. Not really. He says, I've given you cities that you haven't built. And, you know, and consequently, that means other people were doing that, right? Somebody could have looked at the Canaanite cities, the Canaanite prosperity, the Canaanite agricultural breadbasket and all that and said, why is God being so good to the Canaanites? Those no good, idol worshiping, abominable, wicked Canaanites, look, their cups running over. Uh, they've got these great cities. They've got this choice land. They've got this primo, uh, primo environment. Where's the fairness in all that? Well, faith says, you know what? They may be building it, but they're actually building it for me. They don't know that yet, but God's going to take it at the right time. He's going to take it out of their hands and he's going to lay it in mine. And I'm going to live in a house that I didn't build. And I'm going to eat grapes and other things from, from vineyards that I didn't plant. And I'm going to enjoy all this bounty that God used the sweat and the labor and the toil and the ingenuity and, and the strength of others to do. And he's going to give it to me, not because I'm stronger, smarter, faster, whatever, but just because I'm following him, just because he's good. Uh, that's all. And so this is verse 13. He gave you cities. I gave you a land. Uh, you dwell in them of the vineyards and olive yards, which ye planted not. Do you eat now? Verse 14. Now, therefore, 
right? And therefore is a, is a reason word. Therefore means this is the culmination. This is the result of all of these things that I have already listed. Therefore, and we can stop there just for a second and say, when God gives us commands, when God gives us a work to do, when God entrusts some responsibility to us, um, there's abundant reason for it. God doesn't do anything just because. God isn't capricious, right? He, he doesn't just pop, ideas don't just pop in his head and he says, okay, let's go with that and run with it and see where that's going to take us. He doesn't do that. God is purposeful. God is wise. God is all-knowing. He knows us. He knows the situations that we're in. He knows the future. And he knows, getting back kind of what our theme is today, God knows how our decisions are going to impact not just us, but others, not just those we know and care about, but those who are unknown to us. But our decisions will still make a difference, uh, right? You can walk, you can drive down the road. I think sometimes and you'll see billboards that say your decisions behind the wheel make a difference or something like that. You know, you can cause an accident. You can you mess up somebody's life, etc. We know that. We know that strangers can impact us in, in ways that certainly we didn't ask for. And the Bible, of course, which has God's prepared it for us to prepare us for any situation. The Bible includes stories of people like that. You know, one of the uh, one of the greatest, I suppose, is Joseph's story, and in, in in the book of Genesis, the last basically third of the book, how you have this guy who is he's he's well loved by his father, mm -hmm. although despised by his brothers, and he's really despised by his brothers. His his brothers are planning to kill him if they can. They actually are seeking his life, you know, and so in, in but he gets off easy. He's just stolen into slavery and sent to a different country. And we think, wow, that's uh, what, what's God doing with that? But of course, God had a plan for all that. And God didn't forsake Joseph in all that. And Joseph didn't forsake God during those hard times either. Now, we don't have his diary. We don't know, you know what, uh, how every day and every night went for him. We know it wasn't a bed of roses. Uh, obviously, toward the end of, or as you get further into the story, he gets thrown in jail uh, on a trumped up charge that has no, no basis in it whatsoever. And uh, he's there. And then he's forgotten for at least a couple of years. Uh, and so, again, the, the, the normal eye, the natural eye looks at that and says, what is God doing if there is a God? What is going on here? Where is justice? And, and, and the whole thing is totally messed up until we keep reading and we find out what God did through Joseph, right? And how at the end, Joseph, he forgives his brothers. And, and there's a reunion, and, and it's a wonderful thing, as well as Joseph ended up being a savior, uh, physically a savior for uh, that part of the world. So in any case, the Bible gives us these stories, not just, to, not just to entertain us. It's certainly more than that. It's not just to uh, fill up space in the book. You know, uh, it's not that either. God, the Bible tells us that the things that are written in the Old Testament are written for our admonition. Right for our edification, so that we can grow thereby. So you have here uh, in verse thirteen uh, all of these things. In verse fourteen, now therefore, for these reasons which I have just listed and more that that aren't listed, now therefore fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in truth. Put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And we come to verse fifteen. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God, he it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, and which did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way wherein we went and among all the people through whom we passed. And I'm emphasizing the pronouns here. These guys aren't just talking about what they read about, what they heard about, the traditions that were passed down to them by their fathers and their grandfathers. They're saying, no, we have been the recipients of these things. Not just we've inherited good that's come out of it, no, we have been preserved. We have been taken through the desert 
We have been protected from enemies. We have been given this these blessings that surround us now, this land of Canaan. We have, and they are they are aware of it. They're acknowledging it. And so they say in verse 18, we will also serve the Lord our God. And verse 19, Joshua says, no, nah, you can't. You can't serve the Lord. He's holy. He's jealous. He won't forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake him and serve strange gods, then he'll turn and do you hurt and consume you. After that, he's done you good, right? Because we understand God is faithful. And God's faithfulness works both directions. And God made that clear to Israel in the law. If you serve me, if you are obedient, if you keep and fulfill these commandments, then I'm going to elevate you above all peoples. But being in this close relationship, if you reject all this extra truth, care, etc., that I am lavishing upon you, then you're going to be held responsible. And you're going to have a higher price to pay than other random, we want to say, nations that haven't been given these opportunities, these privileges. To us, that's fair. We understand that. To whom much is given, much is required. And so Joshua, he emphasizes that. You say that you will. You recognize that you should. Right? God's done all these things for you. You say that you'll cleave to him. I'm saying you can't. I'm saying you better think twice. Don't be so easy to make a, to make a statement. And the people said in verse 21, nay, but we will serve the Lord. And so Joshua says, okay, you're witnesses. You've all heard it. I've heard it. The rocks that are here have heard it. They're going to be our, uh, our, our memorial stones like, you know. It's kind of reminiscent. And I, this is part of my sermon this morning. It's kind of reminiscent about, about what Peter had said when Jesus had, had announced in the upper room or on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane that this night you're all going to forsake me. And Peter says, not me, Lord. I am ready. If it's necessary for me to die with you, I will. These other guys, they may forsake you, but if everyone else does, I'll still be true. You can count on me. And, of course, the Lord answers and says, Peter, tonight, tonight, during the next few hours before the cock crows, you, not they, you are going to deny me three times. Yes. And it happened. The Lord knew that. Just like the Lord knows whatever failures may be in our life ahead of us. Not that we're planning on it, right? Not that we're saying, uh, I only serve the Lord six days a week and I take Saturdays off or something like that. We're not planning on it, but God knows who we are. God knows the flesh. He knows that the spirit may be willing. Peter's definitely was, but the flesh is weak. Peter's, John's, James's, Paul's, mine, yours. Flesh is flesh. You can only do so much with it, right? And so here you have Joshua saying, you say you're going to serve the Lord. You recognize and can, and can list reasons why you should telling you, you maybe don't know what you're getting yourself into. Now, that being said, Joshua's not trying to discourage them. I think he's trying to establish them. Make sure you know what you're doing here. Recognize the gravity, the seriousness of this commitment that you say that you're making. Obviously, Joshua was a man who did serve the Lord, right? We love Joshua. We love Caleb. These men who cleaved unto the Lord when the whole nation was against them. Right. Uh, one, um, one of those events in the Old Testament is when the entire nation was ready to forsake Moses and Aaron, kill them, along with Joshua and Caleb, who were standing up with them, appoint a new leader and return back to Egypt. Those four stood against the nation. Uh, they, they, they were serious. Right. So here, getting back to Joshua, chapter uh, 24 and verse and verse 15, he starts out this. We, we understand this. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Now, that's the part that we hear a lot of times. And then the following part, ask for me and my house, no matter what you do, no matter what decision you make today and what eventually comes out of it. Because like with Peter's example, you can say one thing and reality may prove to be different. You can genuinely, sincerely, with all your heart, intend to do one thing. 
and those commitments might be forsaken or forgotten uh, at some point. You know, another place, if you want to look, we won't right now, in Romans 7, the end of Romans 7, from like verse 15 to 25 or so, where Paul talks about this internal battle that he faces, and every believer does, between the flesh and the spirit. And you can, you can hear the anguish by him saying, the things that I want to do, I don't do. The things that I hate, I, I find that's what I'm involved in. I'm wrapped up in that stuff. Who can deliver me from this body of death? Paul doesn't say, I'm an apostle. I got this. I can help you, some of you other folks, you know, the, you know a, a few levels. Paul recognized that his flesh was no different. I mean, flesh is flesh. No, no matter no matter who, who it belongs to, who's inhabiting it, it's flesh. It's undependable. And so anyway, in that section of Romans chapter 7, Paul, at the end up, he says, you know, I'm miserable. I'm a wretched man. But I thank God through Jesus Christ because the victory is available through him. So again, we, we uh, back in verse 15, choose you this day whom you will serve. Okay, let me give you a couple things just because we're here in this verse. And this is probably the sermon that you expect to hear. So, so 30 seconds, we'll, we'll, we'll hit that. First part, choose. Choose. You have to choose. It has to be a decision. It's not accidental. Nobody stumbles into serving the Lord, right? Nobody wakes up one day and finds out, oh, I guess I'm serving the Lord now. <laughs> or how did this happen? That wasn't my intention. That doesn't happen. Choose. And if you're going to choose, it has to be a decision, right? Um, choose you. Your parents can't choose for you. Your brothers or sisters or pastors or others, your neighbors can't choose for you. Your elected officials can't say, we're going to lead our nation in this direction and we're all going to come along. No, choose you. It's your choice. And that's why if you if we have to put a title on this thing, we would say that we would say, um, your choice matters. Your choice makes a difference. This is a choice that you have. And and like we can see in the Bible, you can choose to serve the Lord no matter what your circumstances are. You can serve the Lord if others don't. You can serve the Lord if you're in prison. You can serve the Lord if you're in slavery. You can serve the Lord if you're young. You can serve the Lord if you're illiterate. You can serve the Lord if you're old, if you're sick. It doesn't matter. You can choose to serve the Lord. And you must choose because no one else will choose for you. And the choice is not avoidable because each of us either chooses to serve him or we choose not to serve him. Making, saying no choice or putting the choice off is making a decision. It means I don't want you now. I want something else instead. You know, we can try to, to, to trick ourselves or, or, or anesthetize ourselves and saying, I'm not saying no, I'm just saying later. No, that doesn't work. Because in this verse, it says, choose you this day, this day. Right? We're not talking about 20 years from now. When I'm 60, I'll serve the Lord. I don't know. We've got today. You may not have 60. You may not have who knows what. Choose you this day, right now. This is it. This is decision time for each one of us. Choose you this day whom ye will identify with. No, that's not what it says. We talked, I ended up talking to a guy yesterday. Um, and he, uh, he, I don't know, because he runs a business or something, he says, you know, I have, he was wearing, he was wearing a cross. And he said, yeah, I have a cross and I have this Jewish chain and I have a Muslim one too. And I wear them all. So maybe that's good for business because he doesn't offend anybody. But it's not good for his soul. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Not just say, oh, yeah, I'm in his camp or I lean that direction. Or if you had to pin me down, uh, yeah, I'm a Christian. No, it's not choose you this day whom you will buddy up with. It's choose you this day whom ye will serve. That's a tough word, serve. Serve means I'm not in charge. Serve means I'm not I'm I'm not writing the menu. I'm not I'm not making the list for the day. Serve. Now, you know, 
God may tell, tell us to do something and we don't understand how what he gives us to do is service. We feel like it's unimportant. We feel like it's minimal. We, you know, and again, God knows what we can do. He knows how much strength you have. He knows how much time you have. He knows how much everything you have. If God's, you know, if God tells a soldier to go to go stand guard instead of go to the front line and 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 fight, well, the soldier standing guard is still important, right? There were soldier standing guard that should have kept Pearl Harbor from happening or, or other things. That's just an example. You know, the point is, any work that God gives us to do is worth doing. God doesn't just give people busy work. There's a reason for it maybe not known unto us. So we can all serve the Lord. And along with that, sometimes I don't think we recognize how our, um, how our decisions, what kind of, what kind of, what kind of uh, consequences that they have. You know, it's an interesting thing if you look at what Judas did. Judas Iscariot, we understand who he is, the, the apostle who betrayed Christ, who, who sold him out for 30 pieces of silver, who took a band of soldiers and torches and swords and, and spears and led that group to the Garden of Gethsemane to find Jesus and arrest him. And he, he pointed out specifically which one uh, was Jesus by walking up to him, greeting him, calling him master, rabbi, and, putting a, and kissing him, uh, which was the, you know, the standard greeting. Oh, wow. And it's difficult, if possible, for us to imagine a more devious, a more, a more, I don't know, dramatic betrayal than that one. But the interesting thing is, and here's something to think about if you haven't, is the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 27. Let me uh, let me go there just for a second. In Matthew chapter 27, the Bible says this. Uh, when the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and, you know, tried to tried to undo the deal. But it was out of his control now. You know, the uh, Jesus was no longer there. He was already on his way to Pontius Pilate's uh, place. And the, the wheels had been set in motion. And Judas couldn't stop him then. Now, the interesting thing to me is this. Judas, when he saw that he was condemned, I don't know. Maybe Judas just thought, for this 30 piece of silver, I'm going to lead these guys to Jesus. I know they don't like him, but they're just going to question him. They're going to give him a hard time or something. I don't know if Judas actually believed at the time he's going to die. They're going to kill him. Now that was their intention. They had already they had already covenanted together that they had to get a, to do away with him. But the way this is phrased, when he saw that he was condemned, he repented himself. I don't know. The, the thought occurs to me that maybe Judas didn't realize exactly what the intention of the of the Jewish elders was. In any case, it's certainly true. But our actions have consequences, consequences that we cannot predict and sometimes are just shocking. Like, how did I end up here? How did this thing come to pass? This is not what I signed up for. This is not what I agreed to. This is not what I imagined. And yet, there it is. So here in verse, uh, in, uh, verse 15, choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house will serve the Lord. But it's the first part of that verse, verse 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, that's when Joshua says, choose who you will serve. If it seems evil unto you to serve the Lord, if it seems like a bad idea, if it seems like a bad deal, why would it possibly be a bad deal? Well, you know, we can ask ourselves that question. If we're not serving the Lord, why not? I think there's a few reasons, possibly. One of them is there are things that we don't know. It seems evil to us because we don't know. For example, again, weaving all of Scripture together here. Is God just? Is God fair? Is God good? Does God love me? Can I trust him? 
Will he be faithful to me? These are some pretty fundamental questions. And although we are gathered here together in a church, there may be people here that are asking those questions. God doesn't really love me. God's not really following my life. I can slip off, do this, that, or whatever, and it doesn't really matter. Is that what we think? It's not what the Bible says. God that numbers every hair, God that sees every bird, God that knows everything, God that fills heaven and earth, God who sees the end from the beginning, God who has given his son to a cross to bear our sins so that we can be reconciled with him. Yeah, this God, he loves us. He is just. And all things that he does are done with love because that's who God is. Does it seem evil to serve the Lord? Will it pay to serve the Lord? Certainly it will. Maybe not in dollars or lira or won or whatever. Maybe not now. But you know, now is such a small frame of time compared to eternity. Uh, it's, you know, one of those mathematical things. I like math. It's one of those mathematical things where if somebody offers you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you $1,000 a day for the next whatever, or I'm going to give you a penny a day and double it. Which, which, which pay scale do you want? Well, yeah, if you're short timing for a week, I'll take the 7000 instead of like, you know, less than a buck. But then that doubling keeps doubling and the doubling keeps doubling. And eventually you're getting like $50 million on Monday and $100 million on Tuesday and $200 million on Wednesday. And, and it just explodes, right? If you give it time. And you compare this life, 70 years, 100 years. 20 years, who knows, with an endless amount of days, eternity. There is no comparison to that. Uh, I don't know, silly, silliest illustration. Would you like to laugh your head off for, for an hour here on this earth or have a smile on your face for the next 150 billion years? You know, if you could measure joy, how do you get more joy that way? From laughing until your sides hurt and then going on your way or just just being happy for a very, very long time. I don't know. Uh, but in any case, eternity. There is no reasonable way to measure any kind of reward or loss in this life compared to the eternal things that God is offering. It, there just isn't. So in any case, there are some, sometimes it may seem evil to us to serve the Lord because of things we don't know. We don't know what the future is going to be, but we know who holds the future, right? We can trust God, can't we? Friends, that is, such, that, that is a bedrock issue. Can you trust him or not? Do you know him or not? Is he worthy of your affection and love and devotion or not? Choose you this day. If you don't know, then you need to dig in. You need to research. You need to find out. Get the information. Get the facts so that you can reach a decision with the brain that a logical, loving God has given to you. Is he worthy? Will it pay? To serve the Lord. Well, the New Testament says clearly so. It says, uh, I didn't write it down, but that whole idea of we know that our present sufferings are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed to us in Christ Jesus, right? These little things, big as they may seem, wow, are not really a big thing. So some things we don't know. If it's, is it evil to serve the Lord or not? Some things we've heard, but we've misunderstood. Yeah, and again, we're not going to don't have a lot of time left, but um, the Bible itself says that there are some things in the Bible that are hard to be understood. You know, they're, 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 they, they, they're, they're like a gift that doesn't open up the first time you touch it. All right? it, it's, it, it takes some time to un, un, uh, unlock them, to, to find them together. Let me give you an example. Things we've heard and misunderstood. If we had a quiz 
about basic Bible stories. You know, David and Goliath, prodigal son, various things. Somebody could come up with a very boiled down version. Okay, let's take David and Goliath. What's the, what's the, I mean, what's the basic storyline of David and Goliath? I know that story. Yeah, the little guy beats a big guy. End of story. That's it. Uh, no, there's a lot more to it than that. That's the, that's the boiled down version that's got God stripped out of it. Or you talk about the prodigal son. Oh, yeah, this guy, uh, this son, he left and he came home. That's, that's the story of the prodigal son. Really? That's it? No, there's a lot more to it than that. You know, the whole reason Jesus told that story in combination with the other two parts of it is that there's joy in the presence of the angels of God over a sinner that repents. The prodigal son, he went and he did what he did, and he came to himself and he said, I've sinned against God. I've sinned against my father and against God. And so you can, you can, I mean, you can have a Bible story, put it this way, a Bible story book that has no God in it at all. If you don't know these things, if you if you skip over that stuff, and maybe we as parents need to do, need to do a better job teaching our kids what the Bible says, what it means, why it's important, how it affects them. Another thing. You know, there are things we don't know that make, might make it seem evil to serve the Lord. There are things we've heard and misunderstood, maybe. There's another one, things that we've heard but we've forgotten. And the Bible warns us about forgetting things. Second Peter, let's go here and then we'll be done uh, with, uh, with my portion anyway. Uh, I'm sure you uh, can have some, some good feedback over these questions and ideas that we've touched upon. But in 2 Peter chapter number 1, there's a few things in here. Uh, verse number 4, God's given us um, exceeding great and precious promises that we can escape the corruption that's in the world through lust. Verse number 8, if these things are in you and abound, then you won't be unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus. Verse number 9, but he that lacketh these things is blind, cannot see afar off. And hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Moving on down, verse 11 is a tremendous verse about when we actually get to heaven. When you, what's it going to, what's it going to be like when you go to heaven? I don't know. Are you just going to, are you going to slip in the back door? Uh, okay, I'm here. <laughs> Glad to be here. Hallelujah. Where's my, where's my mansion? Or is it going to be Fourth of July kind of thing? Angels lining the streets, souls that you've had an impact on, there to meet you, angels hovering around, uh, trumpets blaring. That's what this verse talks about. For so an entrance, uh, how's it? Okay, I keep looking on the Russian side of my Bible. It throws me <laughs> off. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. How are you going? <laughs> Slipping in, or is it going to be all sails, all sails, what? Flying, pennants flapping, celebration, big deal. I don't know. You can choose. You can choose. Talk about getting a, you know, a fancy restaurant in Manhattan or something. You can choose if you're going to be faithful or not faithful. If you're going to be fruitful or not fruitful, because the two things are basically the same. If you're faithful, that's what God rewards. You may, obviously, someone who's who lives on a desert island with three other people is never going to have a church of 50,000. But if they're faithful with the three that they've got, God knows where they are. God knows where he put them. Point being, so here in 2 Peter, uh, verse number 13, he goes on to say this. Yea, I think it meet. It's fit. It's fitting. As long as I'm in this tabernacle, still kicking here down the earth, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. These are things that you know. Don't forget them. These are things that you know. Let's hit them again. Uh, I'm sure if you ever watched any sporting uh, events on television, you've probably seen somebody that's holding up a John 316 sign. Sometimes it's the same guy, and sometimes, you know, it's uh, the other, other people. You've probably wondered, what good is he doing? I say this because 
John 3.16, if I just if if I ran up to somebody and said, John 3.16, what a blessing, right? What is that, John? Is that a code? Is that an address? Mm -hmm. I don't know. We have John Street, you know, <laughs> up in Manhattan. Yeah. John, what is John 3.16? If you don't know what to do with it, it's just random. My point is, do people know? When they see John 3.16, does that remind them of the verse? Or do they not even have a clue what it's about? They think it's a score of some other game, maybe somewhere else. I don't know. For us, how well do we know the Bible? How well have we unpacked the treasures that God has placed here for us? They're not going anywhere. What are we going to do with them? So this whole question of if it seems evil unto you, why would it seem like a bad idea to serve God? Because we don't know who he is. Because we don't know that he's faithful. Because we don't know that he's a loving father. Because we don't know that he's generous. Because we've been hurt and we pulled in our antennas and, and we're just kind of isolated and, and we're just trying to get through. God doesn't want you on life support. God wants you to be fruitful. He wants you to have an abundant life. He wants you to be effective. He wants you to be touching others, hospitality, uh, etc. If it seem evil to serve the Lord, why? Some, something to think about. If I'm not giving my all to God, why? Be honest. And then find out if the reasons that you're adopting are really truthful or not. Maybe you've been lied to. Maybe you've uh, maybe maybe you've gotten the wrong idea. Let the word of God reorient your thinking, set, set it the right way, and then go forward. Uh, let me just finish with this. Second Corinthians, I think. I thought I had it marked. I did have it marked. Maybe it's not marked now. Second Corinthians, I think. Maybe it's first. We'll find out one way or the other. I think it's first. There's a there's a spot here. Yeah, it's first. You know, one of the one of the reasons why people think it's evil to serve the Lord is because they feel like they're uh, trapped. They've got baggage. They can't. They'd like to. They recognize that it's desirable, but they feel like they can't because of fill in the blank. Their past, whatever. I like 1 Corinthians 6 because the Bible says here, beginning in verse 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators or idolaters, adulterers or effeminate, abusers of themselves with mankind, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. They won't. But verse 11 is worth its weight in gold. And such were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You know, Jesus said, if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And if the Holy Spirit uh, sanctifies you, you're sanctified. It's not a human effort thing. It's a divine thing. God trumps our weakness. He overcomes that. So you can't say, I mean, you shouldn't say, I can't serve God because of what I was. Example A is Paul, right? I was injurious. I was a blasphemer. I was a persecutor. But now I am what I am by the grace of God. So for us, choose you this day whom you will serve. You don't have to be bound by your past mistakes, by your past decisions. You have, don't have to be bound because other people say that you won't amount to anything, that you can't do this or that or whatever. What does God say? God says, choose. Choose. If you want to serve God, you can. You're not trapped into, you know, uh, a, a false religion, though your family may be. Choose you, this day, whom you will serve. 